Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome as you are coming into the Zoom room. Um, my name is Jen Elder. We've been so excited to be presenting this four session series for the HUD Rural and Unsheltered Grantees um, related to better serving people um, with substance use disorders, mental health disorders. So I'm um, so excited that you've probably joined us through uh, all the sessions and now we're here at session four. So I'll just kick it off with a couple of housekeeping slides. Um, next slide. So to start with a quick disclaimer, um, we are funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, but the views and opinions expressed today um, are those of the presenters and don't necessarily represent um, SAMHSA or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Next slide. We are joined today by our American Sign Language interpreters, Pamela and Dave. We thank them for being here uh, with us. We also have live transcription from a, a human captioner, uh, so we appreciate them being here with us today as well. If you have any uh, technical difficulties, just reach out to us. Our team is happy to help. Uh, next slide. And with that, I'm excited to pass it over to uh, Teresa to get us started um, with today's uh, fourth and final session of the series. Teresa. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as Jen mentioned, this is part four of a four part series. Um, just to recap a little bit of what we've covered in the first session, if you weren't able to join us, we talked about um, assessing the whole person care needs of recipients of services in your community and how to center the voices of consumers of those services, services in that process. In the second session, we talked about um, how to create meaningful partnerships and understand what resources are available in your community. Again, so you can meet those whole person care needs that you discovered in your assessment um, and recognizing we can't be all things to all people, but we can make partnerships that allow us to better meet people's needs. Then we got to experience some real life examples of how people have created partnerships to do just that. And today we're gonna talk about increasing access to recovery supports in your community, increasing access to treatment and increasing access in the reach of harm reduction in your community. Um, we're really excited to present on this today. We'll be joined by Jim Duffy later on in the presentation for again a real life example of how he's kind of carried this out. Um, and also we developed this session in response to requests from the community so knowing that this is a need in your communities and something that you would like some more support doing. So again agenda increasing access to, actually we're gonna start with um, peer recovery organizations and providers. Then we're gonna move into the treatment continuum and how either through partnership or within your organization, depending on the need, um, how you can increase or enhance access to that. And then we're going to talk about increasing access to harm reduction and overdose prevention in a variety of different settings in your community. community. We're gonna get kind of specific about that in housing, in shelter, um, just all the places that those services would ideally reach. And lastly, we will hear from Jim. So before we can dive into that content, I think we can't really talk about this without talking about two things. Um, one is the disparate impacts of substance use on folks in our communities. Um, so over 107,000 people died from opioid overdose last year and 140,000 alcohol related deaths also occurred. So I think um, really reflecting on the gravity of that and the importance of what we're gonna talk about today and the willingness and open-mindedness on the part of all of you who are here with us um, to do what you can in your roles to expand the reach to serve folks struggling with these things. Um, we also know that certain populations that you may be serving are impacted more by overdose fatality. Um, so for example, opioid overdose death rates increased 44% for people that are black and 39% for um, American Indian and Alaskan native from 2019 to 2020 where we've seen in some places um, the opioid overdose death 
rate, though still very high, has leveled off for other populations. Um, so we've talked about this in other sessions, but being really thoughtful about what communities we're reaching and what communities we're not reaching and the importance of embracing all of the people in our community in our services. Um, additionally, folks who have co-occurring mental health diagnoses are at increased risk for overdose fatality. Um, and so what do we do about that? We're gonna talk about that a little bit today. We need to increase access to specifically culturally responsive prevention and treatment, um, and expand our harm reduction efforts. And the second thing, I know I said there were two things that we really can't continue this conversation without addressing is the impact of stigma. Um, it results in a lack of prioritization of funding for comprehensive and culturally responsive substance use and mental health systems of care. Um, and it also prevents people from getting the care that they need because I think anyone probably in this audience can understand if you felt like you were going to uh, walk into your doctor's office or your behavioral health provider's office and be treated a certain way simply because of what you were struggling with, you might not return. You might not even walk through that door in the first place. And that's what we see play out, especially with people with substance use disorder. Only 10% of people who have substance use disorder receive treatment. And in a study, the study was done in the Boston area, showed that people who had an overdose fatality, meaning that they died from an opioid overdose, only 51% of people had access treatment in the 12 months prior. That means 49% of people struggling did not make an attempt to get any treatment. And what does that tell us? That tells us there's a whole group of people that we're missing and a whole group of people that we need to shift our approach to reach. The other thing that unfortunately stigma impacts is it limits our ability to deliver what we know is best practice, um, specifically no wrong door or multiple pathways to recovery. Um, and why is that? It's because Sometimes our stigma beliefs prioritize certain viewpoints over others, and so that's not true. That's not true recovery-oriented care. That's not true um, no wrong door. That's valuing as a system certain approaches when the people we're serving might not also value that approach. It's being kind of prescriptive. It's us saying this is the way, um, and not listening to the people that are saying like, no, this is what works for me. Um, so one example of that is. Um, I think our leaning as a system towards abstinence only ideologies, um, that is the pervasive treatment model and treatment dogma. Um, and by lifting that up as the only way, though it may be certainly a way for some, lifting that up as the only way or the only goal of getting support with a substance use disorder leads us to kind of have this dichotomous approach where we create punitive measures to people that can't achieve total abstinence. And that's not what we're here to do. We're here to support people. We're here to help them self-identify goals and to expand choices through partnership or through our own capacity building um, or through our approach so that people have choices that meet their needs. And one example that we want to lift up is kind of, um, we sometimes see a split between housing first or um, recovery housing. And we get into, again, that dichotomous kind of fight about what's the right approach when the answer is both and. The answer is to provide a variety of options so people can select, self-select what works for them and what they would feel supported and embraced by. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this slide. Um, because you are able to access them after the presentation. I actually think they're already available, um, but we have a number of self-assessment questions that you as an organization can take back and kind of think through um, whether or not you're engaging in policy and practice that um, lifts one choice or one way up over all ways or all pathways towards recovery. Um, so for one example is, do we have policies and practices that value one pathway over another? So do we have sobriety requirements, abstinence requirements? Do we 
um, only offer 12 step interventions, um, those types of things. Um, like I said, I think these are really for self assessment. I would encourage you to take a look at these, but we should be challenging ourselves because I think um, sometimes it's, we don't realize how deeply ingrained these beliefs are because it's kind of just been the way. And certainly like the messaging, I know as I grew up with some of the like prevention campaigns, um, it's really been ingrained and it takes a lot of self-reflection and really like evaluation of programming in the voices of the people in your programs and really embracing, embracing and listening to those um, to shift away from that and to challenge what our preconceived notions are about like what works for people. Um, so before we kind of dive into all the different aspects of a sub system of care in more depth, we just want to do an overview um, and talk about the fact that recovery doesn't happen in isolation um, or pursuit of wellness does not happen in isolation. So we have to think of all of these things as different factors um, that support a, a whole person, right? So housing is critical to someone's stability. Harm reduction is critical to someone's wellness. Recovery supports are critical to people's community reintegration and building a life in recovery um, and access to the treatment that people choose. All of these things work together and may play shifting roles depending on where a person's at in their journey. Like over time, uh, we know that return to use is something that happens. And so when return to use happens, harm reduction may play like a more critical role in that person's journey at that time. And as they shift away from that, if they choose to shift away towards abstinence, on-demand treatment might be something that plays a more critical role. So really thinking of the interplay and this as a system that supports someone based on someone's ever-changing and complex, need, complex needs because people are multi-layered and complex. Um, so to shift gears a little bit, we're going to get a little more into detail about increasing access to recovery support and recovery community organizations. So first, I think one thing to think about when we're talking about recovery supports is the use of peers. Um, and if you're not already doing it, encouraging you all to think about how you're utilizing employing peers um, at all levels um, in all different aspects of your programming. Uh, we talked about stigma and how that can be a driving factor for reasons people don't seek support or they don't feel supported by the current systems that are operating. Um, having the ability to walk alongside someone who's also like experienced pieces of the journey that you've experienced, um, it kind of like immediately reduces some of that power dynamic that we all want to get away from and reduces some of that stigma and can really open the door um, to someone receiving support. And also promoting self-determination. Um, I think, well, we're not gonna spend a ton of time on it. I just wanna point your attention to two resources. Um, one being the peer workforce development resource, something that I think has come along with the integration of peers in the workforce um, is really the need to define their roles. Um, I know certainly, Folks have come to me and said, like, you know, it feels like me as the peer, people just say, like, the peer can do it, the peer can do X, the peer can do Y. And so really talking about like what the role is, how they fit into this whole piece of the puzzle, I mean, how critical their work is. Um, and we have an HHRC toolkit that's already available, expanding peer support, support roles and homeless services delivery, which I would encourage you to take a look at. Um, another place to direct people to or to partner with to meet people's needs are recovery community organizations. Once you get these slides, actually you can see the title is in blue, it's a hyperlink um, and it will link you to Peer Recovery Now, which is a resource directory so you can find um, recovery organizations in your community. And I just wanna elevate these as a resource because they do so many different things that are critical to someone's wellness. A uh, big piece being like community integration, like they might offer, um, substance-free social activities, or they might just offer social activities and networking activities for people who are even just considering being in recovery or taking those first steps. Um, it looks different depending on the organization, but they 
all are critical to supporting people and building like a peer network in their community um, as they may be shifting away from things that they might be doing. They support people in building that life um, in recovery. They also are really critical advocacy organizations. Um, some of the ones that I'm familiar with have advocated for things like a living wage for peer support workers, which seems like a no brainer. However, we know that it's become increasingly costly to live in this country and we need to elevate the peer role so that they can do meaning the, the meaningful work that they do. Um, other things is to reducing barriers to treatment based on the voices of peers, based on people telling them about their experience and say like, hey, this, this made treatment hard to access for me. Um, let's advocate for this policy to reduce that barrier. So they function in a number of ways. And I would encourage you again, I know certainly like when I was working in homeless services, um, when we first kind of started looking at our approach in reducing barriers, we weren't partnering with re peer recovery organizations. And so I'm pretty sure that's a, a common experience. And I think just to make that connection so you can support people. Um, and provide the resources that feel helpful to them. Certainly another that I wanna lift up is Faces and Voices of Recovery. This is a national organization um, and they promote the right of every individual and family to recover from substance use disorder and demonstrating the value and impact of long-term recovery. I would certainly be remiss if I didn't mention that though there are many substance use peer recovery organizations, um, they also exist for people that are only struggling with mental health conditions. Um, so one example we've hyperlinked here um, is a psychiatric survivor. And if you aren't familiar with that term, um, psychiatric survivor means that they have gone through the current mental health system in this country, which, um, I think sometimes we lean on too heavily or too quickly as a solution when a lot of aspects of that system can be really disempowering. And unfortunately for folks who have experienced trauma and a situation that took power and control away from them can be re-traumatizing. Um, and so when we say someone's a psychiatric survivor, they've been through that experience um, and they have um, recovered whatever that means to them from that experience. And so places like the National Empowerment Center um, lift those voices up and advocate for system-wide change to uh, move away from some of those harmful practices um, and are just a, a message of hope and recovery and empowerment. I mean, some others that come to mind are certainly uh, NAMI. Again, if you're getting these slides, you can find your local chapter through the hyperlink but also there are a lot of grassroots organizations in different communities and maybe they're not a full organization, but they have like a meeting chapter. One that comes to mind is like Alternatives to Suicide, which is a peer run support group for folks who experience suicidal ideation or um, the Hearing Voices Network is another similar, similar or organization that's national that may have like chapters in your area, um, if not a freestanding like building or office or, or something like that with, with full programming. Um, and I think just the comment is the more stigmatized something is and certainly substance use, suicide and hearing voices are unfortunately quite stigmatized in our society. I hope we are progressively moving away from that, but um, there's much still to do. I think the more important it is for people to be able to find community and often the way that that's happening is through peers. And so all of these different resources that we're lifting up, I think um, thinking about how you can connect people to these resources to build a community where they're not experiencing judgment, where they're not experiencing uh, the shame that sometimes gets put on them, um, unfortunately in different systems. Okay, so we're going to shift a little bit from that to increasing access to addiction treatment. And when we're talking about addiction treatment here, I know previously we called that like it's really a whole system. It all has to work together. 
Um, we're talking a little bit more about like traditional treatment. So whether that's inpatient, inpatient outpatient or medication um, and everything in between. And so to outline it here, um, the American Society of Addiction Medicine has kind of developed levels of care. And I'm just gonna touch on it briefly, but that can be anywhere from like a medically managed inpatient where they're offering withdrawal management, but also uh, medical services. You might hear this referred to as like a level four in your community. And it's usually like hospital based all the way to um, like outpatient long-term remission monitoring. And there are many residential and outpatient levels in between. And I would encourage you to look at this a little bit more on your own time um, and kind of align this with what's available in your community to help you get a better understanding of what's, um, what the different options are. Um, the other thing I will say that is not explicitly out here is that um, medication for opioid use disorder, medication for alcohol use disorder, medication for stimulant use disorder, um, can be interwoven through any level that you see available and even without the addition of these levels of care. It can be a standalone intervention. It actually is in some cases the gold standard standalone intervention. So that's why we're going to start with increasing access to medication. Because like I said, especially for opioid use disorder, it is something that um, can be really, really impactful, um, particularly with um, fentanyl use. Um, methadone is something that I think for a while we were say, being take a backseat to um, Suboxone per prescribing, but again, that wasn't really addressing people's, um, the tolerance that they developed when using fentanyl. And it sometimes was, creating precipitated withdrawal. There's been some creative um, low dose interventions around that, but methadone has recently um, far and beyond been the most effective medication for treating opioid use disorder when in, we're in an all, almost all fentanyl drug supply. Um, so today I wanted to turn your attention to the fact that um, there has been a final ruling about the relaxed guidelines that were put in place during COVID for methadone access. And I am highlighting this a little bit today because um, I'm hoping that you'll be advocates for your community as these changes roll out um, for people to have reduced barriers to get this life-saving medication. Um, so for example, a few things, I have it hyperlinked for the full ruling, um, but a few things I wanna lift up is you no longer have to have used opioids for a year to initiate treatment, which is really important because with the withdrawal and the tolerance that comes quickly with fentanyl use, um, asking for someone to wait a year before they get help or qualify to get help um, was hugely problematic. Um, emergency departments can now provide methadone 72 hours in some um, BMCs, Boston Medical Center, I want to lift them up as one emergency department that's using that to bridge to longer term medication. Um, and all initial examinations for MOUD can be administered via telehealth. Other ways I want to highlight that um, may or may not exist in your community, but if they don't, thinking about how you can advocate or expand your capacity um, are like mobile units, medication units, or if anyone is providing street medicine. Um, within their menu of services, thinking about the um, value add of making sure that that physician, nurse practitioner, or um, physician's assistant is wavered to prescribe medication for opioid use, alcohol use, like naltrexone, um, all of those things really kind of allow to reduce barriers um, for people that are seeking medication for their substance use. Um, again, so if it's not within your own internal capacity, something that you can do is build those relationships. So are you building relationships with MOUD providers? Are you advocating for the people in your care? Um, if there's something that doesn't align with the new final ruling, 
Are you helping the people that you see re-engage or reconnect? Are you building that bridge? Um, are you helping facilitate telehealth? I know certainly um, during COVID, um, we facilitated a lot of telehealth via the outreach ban just by providing access to a phone. It feels simple, um, but could be life-changing for people. Um, and if you have a brick and mortar location, if you are operating a shelter or if you're operating supported housing, just thinking through and getting some guidance on how you might facilitate storage, appropriate storage so that people can get a lot of take-homes, the take-homes that they've earned um, under the relaxed guidelines. Because especially in rural areas, getting back and forth to a clinic, if we're talking about methadone or even sometimes um, suboxone, Getting back and forth as regularly as you used to have to was a huge barrier. It resulted in missed doses, which sometimes were followed up with punitive practices um, and really, really a barrier. Like if you don't have a methadone clinic within 30 miles, is there a bus? Do you have access to a friend that has transportation? All of those things kind of culminate in reduced access and even reduced pursuit of trying to initiate medication. Um, already anticipating that it may not be possible to meet the requirements of the clinic. Um, so if you're able to store things on site, looking into how you might do that. Um, again, building on partnerships, but now moving away from talking specifically about MOUD and medications. Um, there's a lot of different types of barriers to what we think of as like inpatient or outpatient addiction treatment. Um, I'm going to only touch on a few of these just you know, to make sure that we get through all of the content that we have um, in store for you today. But just wanna lift up again, like that access to cell phones, access to transportation, either um, you may operate a van, but you may just think about earmark earmarking a little bit of money to get people um, bus passes or taxi vouchers. Cause I know certainly, um, everywhere, everywhere there's a lack of treatment beds, right? If we're talking about inpatient level of care, but particularly in rural areas. And so when that, if you're working with someone, if you're a case manager, if you are supporting someone and accessing that level of treatment, if that's what they would like to access, um, when that bed comes up, you're like, how am I gonna get them there? And so what can we do internally or who can we partner with um, to make sure that there are no barriers in the person's way once they've made that decision to pursue treatment. Um, and, you know, so we can get them where they need to go, because sometimes that may be quite a distance depending on where you are. I think the other piece to that is making sure you're building connections with the treatment providers in your community. Um, certainly, we are moving away a little bit from inpatient treatment for opioid use disorder overall. Um, people may still choose to go that route, um, but we're moving more and more towards outpatient programming just because sometimes um, that period of abstinence can actually increase overdose risk. So is there a way you can support them in getting to their outpatient program on a daily basis? Um, are there things that you can do if they do decide to go the inpatient route and someone says, oh, they have a chronic medical condition and we need to get a letter from a provider that says, um, we're able to manage this chronic medical condition on our inpatient unit. Do you have the relationships with your FQHC? Do you have your relationships with like a healthcare for the homeless provider where you can facilitate those things? Um, so that they don't become reasons that someone cannot go to treatment that day. Um, also, another one I wanna lift up because we talked about it pretty specifically in the second session is that resource mapping, right? Um, so who is in your community? What level of care are they? And also like what are the treatment requirements for, per your single state agency? Um, for eligibility, I think, I think I've touched on this before, but a lot of times we see unsheltered folks um, be deprioritized because people are anticipating barriers to their treatment um, when we're talking about 20 people all vying for the same treatment bed. So 
we want to know exactly what the regs are so we can and usually you find that out through your single state agency so we can advocate for that person to not be tra be deprioritized and to get access to the care that they need so from that we're going to shift into increasing access to harm reduction services throughout your community and we're going to talk about um, a variety of different settings and ways to apply harm reduction um, principles and practices so before we dive into strategies just to do kind of like an overview of what harm reduction is um, there's two different definitions we're going to cover and that i really want you to think about as you're talking about expanding or implementing different harm reduction practices we kind of um we now have like federal support we have a federal framework for harm reduction we have a lot of funding being given for harm reduction activities although like maybe i would argue like never enough um, but we're seeing that roll out in different ways and some of those ways aren't as all encompassing as they could be so we really want to make sure we're um, attending to those four principles of harm reduction if we're going to integrate that or if we're going to partner um, or if we're going to expand our capacity to provide those services so first and foremost harm reduction is a person-centered practice in policies that empower people to make decisions about their health and lessen the negative social psychological and physical consequences associated with drug use i would also argue associated with a number of other behaviors that many of us engage in there's harm reduction applications for in my opinion almost any behavior the other piece that I encourage you to think about as you're implementing or expanding programming is that like one of the core underpinnings is harm reduction and I'll just read the quote harm reduction with a capital H and R this is the movement one that shifts resources and power to the people who are most vulnerable to structural violence so what are we saying we're saying that as we make decisions about how we're going to implement programming or how we're going to expand upon programming or how we're going to build some of these interventions into our kind of cadence of regular services how are we doing it in a way that gives power to the people that we're working with how are we creating systems for feedback i know we touched on that a little bit in the first session ongoing regular meaningful feedback how are we listening to people and hearing um, their voice and what they are identifying as their need and not taking that um, role of expert or provider? I think, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to say it. Like I went to social work school and there was a, even at the time, it was like a little bit ago, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, very much still focused on the clinician as expert or the service provider as expert. And I think we're shifting away from that, which I think is a really critical thing because we're never going to get it if we're just viewing everything through our lens um, and saying like, I'm going to help these people that have that problem. That's not the right way to look at it. That's not kind of like an empowering approach. That's not a, an approach that facilitates people's autonomy and their self-direction. Um, so we really want to step back and kind of step out of that and unlearn that if that's been part of our education and we want to shift the power away from us as much as possible there's always going to be inherent power dynamics with you as the person who's just the gateway to services but how can we reduce that and how can we really shift all of our pro programming to reflect the needs of people as they state them um, and how do we implement change in programming that meets the needs of people that we, as they state them? So I went a lot into the how in the different underpinnings of philosophies and harm reduction, not all of it. There's probably, well, there certainly is. And I think um, HHRC already has some foundational stuff around that, um, that I would encourage you to look at if you're not familiar. Um, but but why should we do this aside from the fact that we have a federal framework now and aside from the fact that 
um, it's being encouraged, encouraged and finally recognized by the CDC. I mean, there's like decades and decades of um, research backing why these interventions work, but why like for you as a service provider, why should you buy in and why should you shift your focus or shift your approach to incorporate more aspects of harm reduction? One, we're recognizing, and again, finally, this made it to like a federal level that abstinence isn't everyone's goal and recovery is person defined. So when we think about substance use, we tend to either focus on abstinence or use that really has caused some serious impacts in someone's life. And there's a whole continuum in between. Um, Someone who's drinking daily may not be interested in becoming completely abstinent, just as an example. And there's a lot of research and a lot of backing and actually like part of um, an experience that I had with a loved one that show that people can do things to meaningful, meaningfully reduce the damage that comes along with using substances in a way that like does kind of end up on that chaotic or out of control end of the spectrum um, and promote their health and wellness. Um, and doesn't necessarily mean that they have to say, I'm never gonna touch a substance. I'm never gonna do a drug. I'm never gonna drink again. Um, and I think the other piece to that is like harm reduction and treatment are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Exclusive. We did talk about this a little bit when we went back to kind of like that recovery oriented system of care, right? So different interventions may have different value for different people at different points in their journey. Um, and they all can work together for a person to be able to build a life that's meaningful for them. Um, and again, not focusing like the only way to build a meaningful life is not completely stopping using substances. I actually was having a conversation with someone the other day that was like, I didn't care about that at all. What I cared about was going to work and what I cared about was reconnecting with my family. And what I cared about was getting housing and some stability. And when I was able to do that, I started to think, huh, like maybe I shouldn't drink every night because it's impeding my ability to get to this job that I actually care about, or I'm missing visits with my kids. Um, and so really like thinking about the whole picture of a person, I um, mean, how these different pieces play out. So beyond that, our systems need to support all community members. And as we touched on in the stigma slide, large numbers of people don't interact with traditional treatment systems. Um, so harm reduction services are critical touch points that reduce mortality and promote health and well-being. And beyond that, um, I would encourage you as an organization when you're considering implementing this approach or expanding upon this approach to look at what you're willing to include and what you feel like you're not willing to include and what that means for your organization. And then I would really encourage you to reflect on that and challenge yourselves to move outside of the thinking that you should be dictating what people, what services people should and shouldn't have access to. Um, we talked about those core values and what core values we really need to hold on to to deliver this work in a meaningful way that will truly impact the people that we work with. And one of those things is lifting up the voices of people that are receiving our services and listening to folks identify the needs that they have and our value is being responsive to that need and not putting a value judgment on what they state. So like examples, I've seen many organizations say like, I'm happy to distribute Narcan, but what do you mean I have to distribute safer sex kits? I don't wanna support people who exchange sex for money or sex for substances. And I'm gonna challenge you to think about why that is 
because you have to support all the people in your community. That's our role as providers. Our role is to support all people. And so if I'm making a value judgment, that's probably about something that I'm experiencing and that I'm feeling. And really like I need to do the work to open my window of tolerance to supporting all people and leaving judgment behind. Um, because again, that's not empowering the people we serve. That's taking power away from them by saying, I'll do this, but I won't do this because I don't value this. It's not about our values. It's about supporting people based on their values and meeting them where they're at. So again, willingness to provide some services, but not all identified should probably be a flag to think about your core, core values and if you're really adhering to them um, so that you're providing meaningful services. Um, if you're not an organization that's able to expand your internal capacity, I know we touched on partnerships in session two, and I think we actually went through this specific resource, but in case you weren't with us for section two, um, I'd encourage you to check out what's hyperlinked here, which is the North American Syringe Exchange Network. Um, it is it identifies all of the different syringe service and harm reduction programs in your community. You know, we pulled up the map when we did this. Certainly there are places that have um, a lot more resources than others. I think what's really nice about this is it allows providers to self-identify. So if they um, are a grassroots organization that might not be on like a map of places that receive federal funding, um, you can also identify them there. It also gives you a little information about what's available at each site that's listed um, and how they do syringe exchange. Um, if that's something that the person you're working with is seeking, whether it's one-to-one, -one, whether it's needs-based, which is kind of best practice, um, what have you. So there's a lot of information there. So if you are not going to provide these services in-house, um, how are you going to partner to make sure these services are available to folks in your community. So uh, one really concrete example of that is um, previously I oversaw an outreach team, a street outreach team. We were working with many, many people who had opioid use disorder and we didn't have funding ourselves to do syringe exchange, to do Narcan distribution, to do test kit, inter, um, fentanyl test strip distribution um, prior to that being like something you can get for free in Massachusetts. And so we partnered with our local syringe exchange to who were funded to do that, to be able to provide those services um, via like a, an a organizational agreement where we could share some data, de-identified data. Um, the other ways, again, going back to talking about how we're utilizing peer networks. Um, if you are in a rural, rural community, um, the value of peer networks is pretty paramount. So like, you'll hear a lot of people say like, well, if I give one person like 500 syringes, should I really be doing that? The answer is yes, and the research backs yes, right? And I think I would encourage you to go a step further. And if you are gonna provide these services, you should consider paid roles to do just that. So um, make realizing that it's not just your services that are reaching people directly, though that's of course a huge piece. Your services are reaching people who are reaching people who are reaching people in their networks. Um, that's how information is shared, but that's how concrete interventions and like life-saving things like test strips are shared. Um, so considering that I think can be really um, a good way to expand upon harm reduction services if you're already offering them or if you're starting to offering that, offer them. And again, if you have street medicine as part of like your portfolio, working with unsheltered folks, um, are you considering things like wound care if you're in a community where xylazine is present? And I think that's, you know, becoming increasingly common. Um, or are you like I said, with the outreach van, like, are you willing, if you have a brick and mortar to co-locate syringe services or harm reduction services in your building? Like, do you have space where someone could come um, and provide that service? Oh, and I just saw a, mes a message from Alicia about a resource that I wanna call out. 
Um, so a migrant health center in Puerto Rico shared their success with peer distribution in our February webinar for insert service program. So yes, check out that webinar because um, we're not going to get in as much detail of like exactly how you might do that as that webinar could. Um, so I think if that's something that you are interested or willing to do, that you should absolutely take a look at that resource. Um, so now kind of talking more specifically, not about like your community at large, but in specific sites. So if you are operating a shelter as part of the COC or you're operating supported housing, there are just some pretty basic suggestions of how you can expand harm reduction if you're not already doing it, harm reduction and specifically overdose prevention. Um, so one way is making naloxone safer use kits and test strips fentanyl or xylazine test strips widely available. Um, so I don't think it's necessary to really be the gatekeeper of that, in my opinion. So in some of the supported housing or shelters that like I had operated previously, you just have it in an accessible area. You have it not necessarily in a place where like staff are keeping close watch in case someone, again, is responding to that stigma or is feeling not so great about their use or return to use. Um, maybe they are coming from places where there are policies and procedures that would say like, well, you can't be here if you're using substances. We know that's certainly not best practice, but it's something that exists. Um, so they might not want people to know that like, hey, I, I need a test strip. Um, so where is it accessible to people receiving your services, but like doesn't have to be under staff's watchful eye. Like there's, that's just not necessary. Um, Another intervention is like taping it up all over the building, taping it up in your bathrooms, um, examining your own policies and procedures. If you're a place that um, is like not super drug user friendly, um, there are pretty basic concrete things that you can do. So like, I think I've seen a large tendency for people to want to compensate and dispose of people's safer use supplies. Can you hold on to them? until like if you're you know you're not saying people can like use in this space but can you hold on to them until they leave so they don't have to go search out and get those supplies again especially if they're not like close to where they get those supplies um in your community it's really important i mean there's no risk in doing that at all whatsoever there's i think perceived risk but the reality is there's not what actually ends up being risky is that person may not have access to what they need. Um, and they may end up engaging in behavior that increases their risk for like transmissible diseases. We don't want that. Um, so you're helping them, empowering them to support their own wellness by giving them access to these resources and by not disposing of the stuff that's, the very stuff that's keeping them safe and reducing their harm. Um, Reducing and eliminating drug use related service suspensions. I'll never get over the policy that's like, if you experience an overdose in this building, you can't come back. That person just experienced an overdose. It's the last time you want to withdraw support. It's actually when we want to think about wrapping support around a person. So do our policies withdraw support if someone is using substances? If they are, I think that's something you should probably take a look at if you, um, really want to be impactful in the way that you serve people. And then also, I think this can be kind of tough programmatically, but restrictions on coming and going. So um, I'm specifically thinking about people who are trying to avoid withdrawal, and that can be from any substance. They may need to leave your program and come back to your program, um, especially I'm talking shelter, like pretty specifically at this point, um, in order to manage that, whether they have to drink more or they have to use more substances. Um, if you're not able to accommodate that, people aren't gonna come into your shelter that need to address those concerns for themselves. Um, beyond that, making sure all staff and the people receiving your services are trained in overdose prevention. I think there's a lot of accessibility through like local health departments and a variety of different agencies in your community to bring in training, but just make sure that you are training all staff, but you're not just limiting it to staff because the person most likely to respond to an overdose is actually a, a peer, a person who's also using substances. Um, so opening that up to everyone, doing it together as a community, um, 
and saying like, we care about responding to this. We care about keeping you safe and we're gonna learn how to do that can be pretty powerful. Um, if you have the ability, and I know not all of us do, um, if you're doing some capital improvements in your spaces, that could be supported housing, that could be shelter, it could be congregate settings, um, reverse motion detectors in bathrooms. So you know, if you know folks are not, are using in your program, um, and if it's supported housing, like that's permanent housing. So there's certainly that will happen um, because it's not, you know, a, a barrier to entry. It tells you when someone has like stopped moving for a period of time. So you can go on and check on that person. And there's a lot of different ways that this has been carried out in different programming, including supported housing. Um, there are some models who um, hire peer responders who also live in the housing um, and use a variety of different technologies. Like um, one of them is called the Brave button. So if someone's like, I am going to use, I'm going to press the brave button. And I, as a provider, have a system in place for a peer to come check on them or another resident to come check on them um, and make sure that they're okay. And asking for that support and being able to provide that support is really like life sustaining for people um, who are still actively using drugs. The other piece is bathroom check protocols. If you see someone go into your restroom and you know, you're know you aware that this is something that might, they might use, something might happen, you probably wanna check on them every few, like it doesn't have to be super intrusive. I would recommend like upfront saying, hey, this is something that we do. It's to keep you safe. Um, it's to, all we need you to tell us is, yes, I'm still okay. Like you don't have to put limits on the time people use the restroom. Like none of us would like that that's not like a normal human experience that we'd embrace but certainly just communicating that care and communicating i'm checking on you as part of a protocol to make sure you're you're good um can go a long way and certainly um reduce the potential for like an overdose related fatality in the programming that you operate The other resources I want to continue to talk about to expand more specifically like overdose prevention strategies um, is if you don't have like a training through your local health department or you don't have access, um, you may be able to um, use virtual platforms like the example that I hyperlinked here. Um, it's not like a, I don't want to say like it's going to be accessible or like the solution to everyone, but it may be a solution to a number of people. So for one, people who are using substances can go through this website, um, or you can go through this website, and it will take you through like your state. It can link you to the resources in your state that you might not be aware of that are already access points for um, Narcan and overdose reversal kits um, and training, or if there's there are no resources, it can facilitate potentially getting that mailed to people who use drugs that are in your programming. Um, you would have to have a facilitating role in that, like. But I know a lot of shelters, a lot of day drop-in, and a lot of um, brick and mortar programs do allow people to use. Um, them as a mailing address. And I, I don't think that would be a limitation here. So I think if you aren't offering services like that, consider offering it so that they can get what they need. Um, the other thing that many communities have, um, usually through like either the single state agent substance use or someone they contract with, or again, a local public health department is the ability to build in-house capacity. And what do I mean by that? I mean like, you become a trainer of people, so like you're doing like a train the trainer curriculum. Um, so you can then train your staff and the people in your programs and your, when I say people in your programs, I mean recipients of services, if that wasn't clear, um, to respond to an overdose. So you can actually facilitate that training and build your in on team capacity. Um, and a lot of different states have that. I think one that I 
saw recently was a revived program out of Virginia, um, but a lot of public health departments are trying to do that as a part of their community response. And so looking into what those resources are and what resources you can bring on internally. Um, and lastly, I already said this, but making naloxone and test strips widely available. I have a link here to one of the programs in Massachusetts that I think has done this pretty effectively. And that's um, the CNPP program, where you basically become a state affiliate. You learn how to provide an overdose response training. And you can get Narcan through the state for free through the state pharmacy. It's just one example. Several, if not many states have programs like these. So I would encourage you to look at that. If it's not something that's available in your state, I think I would still take a look because it's a model that you can advocate for in your community. Um, as providers of this service in your community, you have a voice in shaping how your health department, how your state responds. Um, so I would, again, encourage you for encourage you to use that voice if it doesn't already exist to expand access to get the resources that you need as providers but the resources that the people in your community need um, and get those those things into their into their hands I specifically did want to call out some technology based um, interventions for overdose prevention um, for folks in rural areas I already mentioned brave technologies a little bit. And I should say that once you get these slides, um, all of these are hyperlinked to the website that give you more informa information about like the exact specifics of how to use different technologies. Um, but there's also a Brave app. Um, and, and similar to the Brave app, there's a Canary app. And that is for folks who are using substances to um, be able to like if they are in a situation where they're using a loan um, to connect to an emergency response or an other trusted person to come check on them um, if they don't check in with the app in a certain period of time. Similarly, Never Use Alone, uh, which is a national organization, though there are local chapters in some areas, is similar idea, but a hotline where the person on the hotline is like a trained Spotter. So if you, again, find yourself in a situation where you are using a loan and you don't have someone to check on you, you can be on the phone with that person and they can um, either connect you again to emergency response or if you've identified someone else in your network that you would like to come check on you. Um, those I think are taking off, if not widely adopted, and I would encourage kind of the distribution of information about that resource for many reasons. One, we know that in a lot of communities, like there's a lot of isolation and there's a lot of space in between people. And so people may not be able to use in community. Also with the emergence of fentanyl and the emergence of different substances like xylazine that keep people under the influence for a longer period of time. People are voicing that sometimes it's safer to use alone than to use with someone who's not a safe person to them. And so what are their options for increasing their safety? And sometimes that's through technology. And lastly, I think, and this is one of the things we really need to be thinking about if we're a supported housing operator is that you know, we talked about that shame, we talked about that stigma and how pervasive it is when we're still at a point um, where people, when they experience a return to use, feel ashamed about it and feel awful about it. And sometimes their first step is not to reach out for help for those reasons. Um, and so they very may well like decide to make the choice to use alone instead. Um, you know, I've personally lost people that way, and these are things that people can turn to to get support, to get help, to just stay safe um, while they're going through that painful experience. And lastly, if I have not, not been on my soapbox enough about this, um, I just want to remind people that people who use drugs are the most likely 
to save a life and reverse an overdose. And so all of these things that we've talked about are really about not just putting resources in our hands as providers, but putting resources in the hands of people who need them on a day-to-day -day basis. So the people receiving our services. And now I'm going to pass it over to Jim Duffy. Um, Jim Duffy's a national advocate for the expansion of harm reduction. He focuses on safer smoking and services for stimulant users. Um, I was fortunate enough to work in a program next to a program Jim used to work in, AHOPE, Needle Exchange in Boston, um, where he started pioneering safer smoking and initiatives leading to the development of SmokeWorks, which he's going to talk about today. And just um, for everyone that's been with us for all four sessions, I I'm really excited about Jim's presentation because it kind of outlines everything we've been talking about from identifying that need, from taking steps to address that need and the impacts of that. So Jim, welcome, and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Teresa, thank you so much. I could not ask for a better setup and introduction and explanation of harm reduction, what it is and what it could be. Um, thank you very much for that. If, if we can hit the next slide. <clears throat> What I'd really like to do today is continue what Teresa started over these sessions and challenge of our ideas of harm reduction. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about pipes. I'm going to be talking about safer smoking and harm reduction, which, if it is not something that exists in your program, um, may very well exist in the partner programs that have been discussed and recommended that we all reach out to to help expand our harm reduction services, or maybe something that people are start struggling to incorporate into the existing frameworks like needle exchange. Um, Next slide, we're gonna just like a quick overview on our time together. I want us to take a hard look at what we're doing with harm reduction and maybe more specifically, who we aren't reaching in that world. What people need, what risk mitigation exists for different substances, different modes of administration and the results and the challenges of that because we have a lot of legal barriers and um, maybe the hardest of all, nervousness, which is why we have this kind of time together so we can explain the practical benefits of like a harm reduction approach that has been kind of sidelined, whereas needle exchange and naloxone distribution are getting the more mainstream uptick. Our next slide is just going to take three points of mind that really Teresa outlined for us already with the two definitions of harm reduction. We heard the, the official lowercase h, lowercase r, risk mitigation concept of harm reduction, but we also heard Monique Tula's quote, capital H, capital R, harm reduction that for me reinforces something else that Teresa said, that we're looking for the ability to promote self-determination among people who are using drugs, whoever our client base might be. For me, when I, when, I, when I challenge myself to look at whether it's a concept related to drug use or not, when I try to take that magnifying glass to harm reduction, I ask myself, I go back to the damn big quote, is this any positive change? And when we use that metric, I find that we can expand our definition of harm reduction to meet the needs of the individual in front of us rather than their needs fitting a framework that we've tried to cater services to. This is all to say, this is a pragmatic approach. When I talk about pipes, I'm gonna be talking about their benefits and it might sound like I'm talking about their benefits as opposed to injection, that might not be untrue, but it's important that I frame this and that focus is not an exclusion, that the time I'd like to spend talking about safer smoking as opposed to injection is not to demonize, exclude, or view injection practices as anything else but a mode that works for a person at a specific time. We're gonna talk about engagement, which is the first step in building a relationship, but engagement based on autonomy, not coercion. We don't go around saying, get that needle out of your arm, here's a pipe coming in with me, I can get you into detox. We provide options for people. Our next slide is gonna kick things off with a look at harm reduction. Now, this is somewhat from the SSP, the needle exchange purview, but I'd like everybody to think about, you may very well be familiar with a place that does exchange locally, or you may be working in a place that does it yourself. What does harm reduction offer? We're talking about syringe access, naloxone distribution, drug checking and testing, which is relatively new, but pretty robust uptick with fentanyl test strips and xylazine test strip availability. But we're also talking about full tabletop setups of machines that can do on-the-spot drug checking for a full analysis of what's an illicit supply for people. 
this alone, <laughs> these three things alone, the first time I walked into an exchange blew my mind. And it was part of my experience coming to harm reduction where I had no idea what was available on the other side of a door like that. And I might, I might argue that programs suffer from a bit of a misnomer, maybe bad marketing. A needle exchange can offer so much, but it's arguably centered on opioid injection drug use when we have a lot of unaddressed issues. Stimulant use, increased injection rates in the time of fentanyl. Now, it's not like fentanyl is brand new to us. We've been responding to that for a number of years now. But one thing we have not responded to very well, I'd argue, is the rising injection rates. Fentanyl, as, a, as compared to heroin, gives us a much shorter half-life and a much more addictive properties, leading to more injections. Uh, may have been as little as a decade ago where somebody could have gotten by with three to five injections a day. That need can be 10, 15, or 20 or more at this point. And we're still beholden some people to one-to-one -one exchange rates. And if only because of budgets limited to meeting some of the needs. We don't have the resources, the robust resources, we'd like to talk about polysubstance use in chemsex. Encephalation, probably arguably one of the more common ways of doing drugs for which we don't tend to give out any tools. Fentanyl contamination of non-opioids, which is just to say that people using stimulants are at risk of overdose, arguably in a different way than those who use opioids who may have a tolerance and may expect a certain contamination in their supply. Our messaging does not hit all drug using audience, audiences, not to mention those that are subjected to illicit press pill consumption, which a pill could be anything. Our next slide, thank you for taking a moment with, you, with me to look at what we have. And like I said, take a hard look at who we may be leaving out. This slide has informed a lot of our work. This is the 2021 Washington State Syringe Service Program Health Survey. Washington State contracts with um, um, State University for a biannual review of their work, which gives us some of the most robust surveying that I have seen out of the US. Now, granted, this is specific to the region, but a uh, sample size of 933 participants, we're looking right now at main reasons for smoking rather than injecting. I have broken this table down into one, two, three, four, five categories, and I've highlighted one that's the most important to me. Easier, of course. In the orange, we see 40% of participants surveyed saying that smoking is easier than injecting. General preference, 15% for reasons of self-care or other. But the social aspect, I'd like to sit with that for a moment. 27%, which is a combined total from um, our the idea that this reduces the risk of overdose by being around other people and that smoking is more available and social. When do we lose people? We lose folks more often than not when they're alone. And alone means a lot of things. Alone can mean not necessarily behind the 7-Eleven or behind a dumpster injecting. Alone can be upstairs in the bathroom while your family's downstairs cooking dinner. Alone can be in the room right next to someone who could save your life or help you. Alone can mean a lot of things, but it is when we lose people the most. And I'd like to present that we have the opportunity to reinforce a mode of administration that reinforces a social use. And that's a cross-cultural phenomenon, that smoking is a shareable social experience, one that we might be wise to support rather than demonize or leave sidelined like we have for most of the, our time in harm reduction. Now, if you've seen recent data, then you've seen the recent report, the next slide is gonna show the CDC report. And there is a reason why these two are back to back. This is a 2024 publication from the CDC that um, roots of drug use among drug overdose deaths. States in no complicated way that we see a dramatic increase in mortal overdoses from smoking and a decrease in those from injecting. Paraphrasing here, the number of deaths was evidence of smoking increased 109%. And by 2022, smoking was the most commonly documented route of use in overdose deaths. In and of itself, a statement that can be used to make several arguments, but we're going to look at the next slide for some better context on that. Because while we saw this rise simultaneously from January to June 2020, July to December 2022, the percentage of overdose deaths with evidence of injection decreased 29.1%. Now, I'd like to pair this with that chart that we looked at from Washington State, which told us in, a, in, in 
in plain language that there is a preference for smoking that we are not able to meet with antiquated paraphernalia laws, limited budgets, and a lot of cold feet around providing safer smoking materials to folks. We have a preference that is partially in response to the contamination of supply, a perception of social safety nets, literal safety nets, life-saving safety nets and the social aspect that can help people survive a drug using experience if we provide the right tools. Our next slide, just to kind of cap off this CDC data, they've given us action. On the coattails of the NIH report that said we need to do more for people who use stimulants and incorporate harm reduction approaches, if, you, if you're with me, you'll notice that they've said everything except for pipes so far. On those coattails, we have the CDC recommending strengthening harm reduction services for people who are smoking their drugs and highlighting that harm reduction programs in many states, despite local laws, have adopted safer smoking supplies to reach new drug using populations. Our next slide is gonna take a wider look at what we have to offer, the list we went over, and just to kind of quickly revisit that list. I'd like to ask you to think about in our time together, the harm reduction services that exist in your community, whether it's naloxone, it's needle exchange, it's low threshold shelter or housing. Take a look at what we have, but also take a look at what we're missing. When we go back to that list, because that was not comprehensive. What really happens inside us in exchange doors, for example, is a kind of compassion, empathy, and stop at nothing kind of ethos that just does not exist in the world of services for many folks, many places. To say needles, Narcan, testing, HIV testing, so on and so forth, is almost insulting to the kind of work that gets done behind those doors. And when we remember that we're looking at a very small subset of the population who's being positively affected by those, this is our opportunity to open that door up much wider and bring new people into that fold of services. Going back to the risk mitigation definition, the nuts and bolts practical definition of harm reduction, it's nothing new for most of us. We know about needle exchange and we know why we do needle exchange. HIV and hep C prevention, and it really doesn't stop there, especially in the age of fentanyl in injections increasing and contaminations like xylazine in our supply. We're looking at trying to prevent at all turns soft tissue infection, things that could develop to endocarditis, things that bring up, bring folks or would bring folks into the ED, but unfortunately don't even because of sometimes the stigma and the way they may have been treated there in the past. But these are things that can be taken care of in-house very often. We look at our injection supplies. Why do we offer syringes? Because a reused syringe, look at this on the left, is about the scariest thing I've ever seen, not to mention if it's been shared, right? We offer things like cookers and tourniquets because in the absence of the right tool, something will be found. That something could be the underside of a soda can, a spoon, but literally something picked up off the ground could end up doing that job if we don't offer the right tools. We see the cottons there. Those are usually used as a filter. In lieu of those, you might see folks using anything from a cigarette butt to a piece of their shirt or lint from their pocket. Risk mitigation is not limited to injection though. When we think about smoking, not only as an alternative to injection, because it is very much that, but in and of itself, absent of like the entire injection, injection practice, there is a safer way to smoke and a harm reduction way to smoke that we can support. Let's say there are no pipes. What would people be looking at to get the job done if, if smoking was their mission that day? A light bulb? I don't know. There is not time to give you the list of chemicals that exist in a in a light bulb, nor is you know any more than there is for that list of chemicals that we see in cigarette butts, which is why we give sterile cottons. Foil, which arguably gets a bad rap because in and of itself, not necessarily a bad tool, but it's reuse, its tendency to get shoved inside a pocket, collecting bacteria, all less than ideal. But we have the option, just like a new syringe, to supplement people's like repurposing of items with a purpose-built product. We can give things like a pipe made for right here on top is a really unique looking pipe specifically made for tar heroin. Below that, we have a very, very simple crack stem. These are items that cost nine to 11 cents each in the face of you know, injection supplies full of accessories, demanding a lot of time, attention, space for the injection process. We can give people 
a small amount of supplies to get the job done as safely as possible and subvert all of those risks associated with injection. Our next slide is gonna give us a better look at some of the accessories. I'm gonna go quick here. Think of mouthpieces. What is, if we had to guess, the most likely avenue for disease transmission when sharing pipes? Broken, chapped lips, cut lips, broken pipes. We can avoid all those with something as simple as a silicone mouthpiece. Screens and filters. On the left, we have a Brillo pad. We usually go by the name brand Shore. Copper coated, full of chemicals. Not what, not at all what we want people using for a smoking experience. We can provide screens, something much safer for their <laughs> in respiratory respects, easier to work with. Shore is something you need to roll in your hands, which is just a job at collecting bacteria. These are all things we can avoid. And when we engage people with these things, who might not know they're at risk of a contaminated supply, might not know that there's a world of services for harm reduction and people who use drugs, we can provide them with tools that they didn't have before. Providing pipes alongside, alongside syringes makes those options those possible. And every injection event replaced by smoking reduces the likelihood of HIV exposure just by nature of not needing injection supplies. We can get people at that up at that point. We can get them test strips. We can get them connected to care. This is engagement, but it's risk mitigation too. We've looked at the accessories. I'd like to show you some of the re results with the, with the time that we have remaining. Our next slide is going to look at an internal survey of about 49 um, organizations that I've had the pleasure of working with over the last few years. Top hit, the results of pipe distribution at their organization, this is nationwide, greater engagement of existing clients, new people coming in, and overall happy clients. Now, granted, these can mean a lot of things, but there's really no holes to punch in 47 respondents saying that their clients across the board are happier. Let's look at people's preference for injecting. Again, when we provide the right tools to provide options for folks, people are injecting less. When there's more time, I like to give some, I like to ask some rhetorical questions. Usually I like to ask at the top, is safer smoking overdose prevention? It does, it, it, after all, it gives the ability to titrate. You can use, you can use what works for you. Literally take a breath, see if you need some more. That in itself, I think the answer is yes, but look at it through the opportunity of naloxone distribution. Soft data, when we did this in Boston, we rolled out pipe distribution the first three months. 50% of the folks who came in as new engagements with us and left with only smoking supplies, no injection equipment, 50% of them left with naloxone. That's Narcan on the block, in the house, in the room, in the pocket of the person who might need it and didn't know they were subject to contaminated supply that puts them at risk of overdose. Our next slide is actually some really new, really new data to me. This is a partner program I get to work with, uh, Green County, that gave us explicit permission to use this, who is able to report a 192% increase in SSP interactions after introducing safer smoking supplies. They brought in pipes and they brought in, they've more than, they have increased their participation by 192%. To match that, Smaller data, increased reach of BIPOC participants from 2% in 22 to 12% in 2023. I'd like to sit with this for a moment because it's very easy to kind of misconstrue construe some of this data. Did they reach BIPOC communities because they have pipes? Clearly. Did they reach BIPOC communities with pipes because that is because pipes meet the drug of choice in those communities? No. We meet different communities with different relationships to injection. And that can look very different, many different places. It's worth going a little bit in that. One more slide, if we could. We're going to look, because it's only fair to look at the barriers. When it comes to pipe distribution, the results are staggering. I can give you slides all day on 192% increases. I can give you feedback from partner programs all over. But let's be pragmatic, as that's one of those tenets of harm reduction, and look at some of the barriers that we face. Funding, first and foremost. Now, I'll argue that could probably be the leading result in any poll that we take of uh, barriers to harm reduction or any of our social services. But funding is a big one because we still have a ban on federal funding. 
a lot of cold feet at the local level and level and very, very narrow avenues for um, philanthropic or grant funding to support safer smoking. We need to recognize these benefits. And we're going to take us back to that Tacoma report from Washington and that CDC report. I'm going to point out, as we're looking at these barriers, that before the CDC gave us this guidance, we had the information, we had the knowledge, we had the power and ability to do something with it. We need not wait for that level of data to come down. We need to wait for the people to tell us what they, we need not wait rather. We need to respond to the people they're telling us and have been telling us for years that they want more than just needles. There are many different ways to do drugs, yet we arguably support one of the more complicated, time and labor intensive and riskier modes of administration while ignoring those that could really bolster the autonomy of the person we're trying to help. Put that soapbox aside. Availability. Funding is one thing. Let's say somebody writes you, writes you a check and says, go get everything your organization ever dreamt of. Where are you going to go for something like that? We're seeing an uptick in availability, but it's not something mainstream. You can go order syringes, bio bins, tourniquets, cookers, and cottons from McKesson or Medline, but I don't think they have a crack pipe catalog yet. And these are things that we, I can, it can sound funny, but we need to work on that because people need to obtain the materials they need to do good for the folks they're helping. Community involvement, that can mean a lot of different things. I'm going to lump that right in with police, government, and legal. Media as well, because the community involvement, the backlash, alone can be enough of a hurdle to prevent us from expanding services. If given that opportunity, I would love to ask folks what they might imagine a world that responded to the crack epidemic, that responded more appropriately to the HIV epidemic, would look like if we had safer smoking for the last 30 years, but just now started talking about injection supplies. And I think that our nervousness, our pushback, the cold feet, the nimbyism would probably be a pretty on par. But this, again, is a bit of a thought exercise just to challenge our thinking about what harm reduction is, who, we are, who we're taking into the fold, and who we're leaving out. Media, you've probably seen some stories about this in the past. There is a uh, likelihood that there will continue to be more. This is a really misunderstood and easy to misframe public health intervention. Our next slide, I believe we're going to look, now that we've looked at the barriers, I want to show you the results. And I don't want to show you data. I don't want to show you numbers. I want you to hear what some of the feedback that trickles back up to us is like. And I'll be honest, some of my favorite is not in here. Some of the most impactful to me is not what the public health world wants. Not the metrics that we're looking for. But let's remember that behind each and every one of these quotes is an individual who's greatly impacted by the availability of a tool that reinforced autonomy in a world really not catering to their health and well-being. Speaking of autonomy, we had one participant go from constant injection-related abscess to none in about two months because of the use of pipes allowed him to quit injecting. Now, when I started this in Boston, let's Teresa referenced. It was engagement for me. I'm very guilty of the first thing that I told us not to fall into. I wanted to engage more people. It was my job to go out there and meet people and try to help them. And what's worse than having something for eh, four or five out of 10 folks and then telling the rest that, no, sorry, we're not here for you. This is something for everybody. Along those lines, engagement and equity. Pipe distribution has opened up so many conversations we didn't know about before. We now serve a wider range of people. There are folks out there dying to know what we have to offer who have no reason to engage with us. Back to overdose prevention. This quote, I believe, most of our ODs, and this is from someone from down south who told us most of their folks overdosing are seeking coke and crack. So this allows us to engage better with smokers and help them get test strips. An entire audience of drug using people who don't know they're at risk for overdose because we think of harm reduction and those risks specific to opioid injection. So in their, in their mind, the threat doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply to my mode of administration, nor does it to the drug of choice. But those aren't realities anymore. We have to make sure we're, we're meeting everybody. When it comes to point number four, HIV and hep C prevention, because we distribute pipes, this program says, we have been able to test more people for infectious disease and have connected with at least two people 
living with HIV who'd fallen out of care. This actually rolled into us from a program on the East Coast about three months into my work and changed the entire way I felt about what we were doing. Because to that point, it had been engagement for me. It was at least a tool I could use to go out there and meet people with. I forgot, though, how impactful that engagement can be when we set up the right programs, when we set up the people that came into this field to do as much as possible for as many as possible. Amazing work can be done. Now, maybe this person stopped injection, stopped injecting. Maybe they had a bad day, never went back to that clinic, never went back to that SSP. But the answer was as simple as a pipe. It gave them what they needed. And I'm going to wager to think what they heard when they received that pipe was, hey, no judgment. I know what you need. I hear you. I see you. And if nothing else, if that is our motivation for safer smoking material distribution, we're doing it the right way. If this is to bolster the autonomy of an individual, all of the other positive effects will fall in line. I think that is the slides. I would really like to take a second to thank Teresa and thank everyone at HHRC for setting this up and being willing to have a conversation, pushing the envelope a little bit and what our definition of harm reduction is. And I really hope that we can uh, do some conversation and questions after. Thank you so much, Jim. That was really informative. And I hope, like you hope, that it expanded people's perspectives in thinking about the services that they offer and the ways in which they meet the needs of people. Um, so with that, we're gonna wrap up a little bit. I want to um, point everyone to some existing HHRC resources. Some of them I referenced during the presentation um, about expanding peer roles, about boosting the power of harm reduction, which focuses on culturally responsive practices um, and many of the other listed here. Again, you will get these slides and they are all hyperlinked um, in those slides and they're available and the recording will be posted next week. Um, also, please, um, if you have more questions about how to do this in your community or specific barriers or challenges that you're running up against, um, you can submit a question through um, the portal to get an answer from Rachel or I, and we'll you know tap to our networks and get a response for you. Um, so when you do submit a question in the subject, if you could please um, use the heading HUD special NOFO grant ETA question, that will ensure that it gets to us. Um, and we would love to take questions to help you expand this in your communities and have those conversations. So that is a resource that's available to you. And lastly, for um, your certificate of participation, if you could please either use the QR code or the link or the link that Alicia dropped in the chat to do the evaluation, um, not just for the purposes of your certificate, but also um, for feedback for us in what has been helpful, what you'd like to see moving forward, um, adjustments that we can make to better meet your needs um, as community members as you try to meet the needs of the people that you're working with. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I really appreciate having you all here. I hope you walked away with some things to think about um, in some ways that you can adjust your programming to meet people's needs and um, really be the responsive providers and continue to do the good work that you're all doing. So again, I hope you have a great rest of your day and thank you so much for being here with us.